Welcome, folks. So last time we talked about George B. McClellan and his term as commander of the Army of the Potomac. Then we went over George B. McClellan's full history, his life, where he went after the war and all that. Last time when discussing the Army of the Potomac, though, Lincoln finally had enough of George B. McClellan and officially replaced him with General Ambrose Burnside. Before we continue, thank you all as always. I know I probably sound like a broken record at this point, but you guys really do make this channel. Without you folks, there's no reason for me to make them, so thank you so much for watching. For our new viewers, I hope I can earn your subscription. Please like, share, and subscribe, and let's get into Ambrose Burnside's term as commander of the Army of the Potomac. So Burnside was officially made commander of the Army of the Potomac on November 7th, 1862. Originally, he was reluctant to accept command, but he was informed if he did not, General Joseph Hooker would be made the new commander. Burnside disliked Hooker immensely. Hooker, Hooker had quite a reputation for allowing certain activities, which I will go into more detail about in our Hooker video. But Lincoln demanded action against the Southerners. Burnside then devised a plan. Usually armies in late November or early December would begin settling in for Wisno's winter's quarters. That period when roads would be impassable to move through because of the snow. But also give both armies time to relax, recover, and mend their wounds. Intelligence told that Lee was spreading his army of two corps across northern Virginia. James Longstreet and his first corps were in Culpeper, appearing to settle in for the winter, then towards the no north, towards the Shenandoah Valley, Stonewall Jackson and his second corps were looking to settle into Winchester. From all reports, they were settled and Lee was not prepared to move quickly. So Burnside made a plan. He would strike across the Rappahannock River, seize the city of Fredericksburg, then with his army, the largest force ever in the United States of 122,000 men, he would aggressively attack Richmond before Lee had time to concentrate his forces. He also reorganized the Army Corps into Grand Divisions. The right Grand Division was commanded by Edwin Sumner and was composed of the 2nd and 9th Corps. The 2nd Grand Division was commanded by Joseph Hooker, comprised of the 3rd and 5th Corps. Then finally, the left Grand Division was commanded by William Franklin with the 1st and 6th Corps. In reserve, he placed Franz Siegel with the 11th and 12th Corps. So instead of preparing for winter quarters, Burnside double-quicked his army to the banks of the Rappahannock. No rebel movement was reported. Everything was going well until one thing. Burnside knew the bridges across the Rappahannock had been destroyed, so he worked the Army Engineer Corps to build pontoon bridges across the river. But the bridges were delayed. So the Army of the Potomac sat on the river waiting. Burnside was approached by Darius Couch, the commander of the 2nd Corps. One of his division commanders begged that they ford the river and not wait. Burnside refused to believe that Lee would be able to move quick enough to stop this plan. So he assured Couch and his division commander, Winfield Scott Hancock, that all was well. However, Lee had indeed discovered the plan. Having moved James Longstreet onto Maury's Heights beyond the town and directed Stonewall Jackson to take up positions south of the Heights. Fredericksburg meant more to Lee than just a position on a map. It was here where he had grown up and indeed met his own wife. While the Army of the Potomac sat on the north side of the river, General William Barksdale and his Mississippi Brigade began to take up positions in the town. As the civilians of the town were evacuated on Maury's Heights, Hancock, across the river, knew they were about to be massacred. Finally, on December 11th, the, br the bridges arrived. The men began to build the bridges. Slowly as dawn set in, Barksdale and his men could see the engineers building the bridges. They immediately began to fire on the men. Burnside would not divert from his plan approved by the president, so he sent men to protect the engineers fi returning fire at the Confederates. He did not want to open fire on the town to cause destruction to the civilians, but at 3 o'clock p.m. he could no longer make an excuse to not. The cannons at Safford Heights began to fire on the town, 
to push the sharpshooters and Barksdale out. Also men from the 7th Michigan, 19th Massachusetts, and 20th Massachusetts were sent on pontoon boats across the river to create sort of a beachhead to cover the construction and force the sharpshooters off the riverbank. After the vanguard of Sumner's Grand Division cleared the town, Burnside now saw that Longstreet was entrenched on Maury's Heights, and then could see Jackson's army spread to the south. Virtually, Lee had now bottlenecked the only crossing the Federals had, but again, he did not want to repeat McClellan's record of not following commands. He decided they would attack. After moving his troops across on the 12th, on the 13th, they began to assault in waves towards Maury's Heights. Sumner would attack first, then followed by Hooker. Franklin was given the job of dislodging Jackson in the south, but he did not realize Stuart's cavalry was capping the Confederate southern flank to the river. Franklin would actually have some success when General George Meade's division broke through for a moment. But by night of the 13th, the fighting was over. The slopes of Maury's Heights were covered in dead Federal troops. That night, Burnside, filled with guilt, suggested that he would personally lead his Ninth Corps to break the Confederate defenses on the Heights. But he would be talked out of it. A whole day passed. Finally, Burnside withdrew both armies north towards Norfolk, returning Fredericksburg back to the Confederates on December 15th. Burnside was humiliated. His great army was defeated, and he had earned the name from his political enemies, the Butcher of Fredericksburg. He knew Lincoln needed a victory, especially being January 1st, 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation would officially become law. So Burnside decided they would rest for a few weeks and then return and try another flanking maneuver in January against Lee. But generals in the army, including Hooker, would actually go directly to Lincoln and beg him to intervene, stating that Burnside would get them all killed in this mud march, echoing the Battle of Fredericksburg. Burnside would then confront Lincoln on the subject. He would demand all insubordinate officers to be court-martialed. He then even offered his resignation of command of the Army of the Potomac. On January 26, 1863, Lincoln would accept his resignation, now establishing a new commander of the Army of the Potomac during winter quarters. That man would be General Joseph Hooker. The very man Burnside attempted to stop from receiving the command. The Battle of Fredericksburg will be the largest battle fought in the United States, with over 200,000 men on the field. Burnside's reputation would be tarnished for the failure and lead to Joe Hooker now in command. Thanks for watching, friends. Our next video will be an episode on Ambrose Burnside, who actually had a very interesting life. It was not a terrible commander. Thanks for the support. Please like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you in the next one.